Welcome to Edison Open House Global Healthcare 2022. In this session, we're going to look at MidaTech, a drug delivery technology company. And with me is its CEO, Stephen Stamp. Hello, Stephen. Hello, Vivian. Now, drug delivery, we're not talking logistics here, we're doing bio delivery. So tell me, why do we need something like this? So bio delivery and bio distribution of medicines, which is what our technologies are focused on, is designed to deliver the right amount of drug to the right place in the body at the right time. Now you've got three different technology platforms, QSphera, MidaSolve and MidaCore. Can you tell me a little more about them and tell me why uh, they're different from other drug delivery solutions? Okay, well, QSphera is a microencapsulated uh, polymer based uh, delivery system. Um, it's designed to be combined with a polymer and injected into the body to form a depot, which then disintegrates and, and bioresorbed over time. So that's a long acting injectable. And we can deliver drug uh, over a period of up to six months, and we can eliminate the peaks and troughs in uh, blood levels that you would normally see. If you were taking, for example, a tablet every day or even twice a day. But that's QSphera. Uh, Midasolv is specifically designed to turn inherently insoluble drugs into soluble drugs. And that means that drugs which are only currently, for example, taken orally may be solubilized and injected. And if they can be injected, then you can inject them into a place in the body where you want the drug to act, for example, in a tumor. And one of our programs is focused exactly on that. And gold nanoparticles um, are two to four nanometers across and are capable of getting in the gap between cells and actually into cells. And they can be either used as a targeting method with a uh, sort of pharmaceutical payload, or they can actually um, have therapeutic effects themselves, depending on what products they're conjugated with. So another form of delivery. And all of this is really important because you, uh, as we get more and more uh, drugs, particularly the biologics, they're, you know, it's not enough just having the drug, you need to have the drug delivery system. But why are you better than others in this space? Well, Acusfera technology, for example, um, is we believe is superior to some of it, at least of the other technologies available because um, the unique manufacturing method that we have enables us to make a product which is it's called mono dispersed. And by that, I mean all of the uh, microspheres are of the same size, uh, have the same drug content, and therefore degrade at the same rate in the body. Some of the alternative methods, you have little ones, large microspheres, um, and uh, they don't have a uniform drug content, and therefore they're rather unpredictable. The other thing about our technologies is that they are tunable. So uh, we are able to extend the life of the drug, shorten the life of the drug, uh, increase the immediate burst, uh, reduce the immediate burst, etc. So they're quite adaptable. Now, QSFAR, I know, is your near-term focus. Tell me a bit more about uh, the pipeline for it. Sure. So we have two internal programs. Um, one is focused on Brexpiprazole, the, long, uh, the, the last of the antipsychotic products not to be formulated in a long acting uh, formulation. Um, we think we have data which demonstrate that uh, we could manufacture a 90 day product. Um, that obviously brings patient convenience, uh, but most importantly, uh, patient compliance. One of the major issues with these antipsychotic products is that the, uh, the patients don't take the product because they don't take it, it's not working. So that's one of the advantages there. A second product, is a uh, version of tacrolimus. So tacrolimus is a drug used in anti-transplant rejection, and it has a rather narrow therapeutic window. So what I mean by that is if you underdose the product, uh, you get transplant rejection, overdose the product, and you get excessive immune suppression. Both of those can have very negative outcomes, of course, for the patient and the health system. So what we think we can do is we can deliver consistent blood levels over extended periods and remove those peaks and troughs. Uh, there's also a question about food interaction, which you get when you take the product orally. Uh, of course, if you're injecting, you don't have that problem. 
So those are our two internal programs. And then we're working with a partner on their APIs uh, to uh, deliver proof of concept. We're not allowed to disclose the partner, unfortunately, or the APIs because they're proprietary. But the idea would be that they would be uh, delivered uh, to a specific site in the body uh, using AccuSphere technology. And then lastly, we are working on um, monoclonal antibodies. So this is a world's first. Um, nobody, in our uh, opinion anyway, has been able to develop a long-acting version of an antibody because the molecules are very large and susceptible to being denatured. And our manufacturing system is relatively benign. And we've been able to demonstrate that we can develop these products in a long-acting injectable without denaturing the product. That will make, that's what makes us a little bit different and maybe a little bit special. Um, actually, your technologies give new life to some medicines, new indications because of the, what you are able to do for those particular medicines. That is entirely possible, yes. And life cycle management, of course. We can extend the uh, life of some of these medicines. Now, uh, tell me a, a bit more about another key programme of yours, uh, MTX110, which is uh, being developed with your Midasol platform. Right. So how that programme started was the company did a screen, uh, an in vitro screen of, I think it was more than 80 uh, chemotherapeutic agents uh, against patient-derived DIPG cell lines. Now, DIPG is a ultra-rare brain cancer in children. And significantly, the best product in terms of cell death was a product called Panobinostat, which is actually on the market for multiple myeloma. Uh, the trouble with Panobinostat is it's not um, soluble. So we applied our Midasolve technology to the product to make it soluble. And by making it soluble, we have been able to use a pump and a catheter to deliver the solubilized panobinostat directly to the brain tumor. So not so via the mouth. So it the blood-brain barrier. Exactly right. And as you probably know, the blood-brain barrier is a major obstacle for most of these drugs to be uh, active or, or therapeutically effective. Um, and of course, yes, we cross the blood-brain barrier. And by doing so, we can get about 100,000 times the drug in the brain tumor than you would get if you took the product orally. That's really exciting. Now, what are your clinical plans, your commercialization plans uh, for that? So um, we, have a, uh, we have data from a phase one study uh, that we announced last October, and we're, we're getting ready for a phase two in DIPG now. Uh, we're just talking with the FDA about the structure of that study. That is an important discussion because you know, all being well, because there are no alternative treatments, and because this is an ultra-orphan product, it may be that we might seek registration on the back of that phase two trial. So getting it right is extremely important. We've also been encouraged by some similar preclinical data that I just explained in DIPG uh, in other experiments with GBM, which is glioblastoma multiforme, the adult form of brain cancer, similarly encouraged. And so we're just about to kick off a phase one study in GBM. That is a much larger market, it's sort of three to five billion. And the, the treatment options, again, are pretty poor. Um, so, you know, we're quite hopeful there too. They're very limited, aren't they? And they're resistant to, you can't really use surgery because they have all these kind of funny little projections that make it impossible. So it, it's a real unmet need there. It um, is, it's, it's, an, it's very sad and very intractable cancer. It's almost always, and I think probably always leads to death. So what are the key milestones we can expect for you from you over the next year, which sounds as though it's going to be a very exciting year for you? Yeah. So we've already started conversations around our Brexpiprazole product. We have nice uh, in vivo data, for, which demonstrates a 90-day product profile, which is perfect. Uh, so I'm hopeful that uh, we'll be able to announce some kind of licensing deal with that. So Crolimus probably needs one more iteration before it's ready for prime time licensing. So that should be ready sometime in the middle of the year. And then we have um, our protein work, 
uh, where I'm hoping to be able to announce something relatively shortly on that. Probably not a license, but a, a, a collaboration with a, a pharma company to take the data that we have to the next level. And then lastly, we should have um, some uh, progression-free survival data uh, from our MTX110 program sometime late third quarter of next year. So those are kind of the upcoming milestones. Now, it sounds in, it, as if you're moving into more partnerships and uh, licensing opportunities. Um, tell me a bit more about that. Yeah, so um, when we did our strategic review in April last year, um, we kind of realigned our strategy, and I borrow this phrase from the US, to a multiple shots on goal strategy. So rather than try and take one product all the way through to market with our limited resources, there are only 20 people in our company, uh, we are developing, uh, I think it's nine programs in our portfolio in total. And the idea is to bring each of them to a proof of concept stage, which may mean animal data and, and some basic talks work, uh, and then look for a partner to take the product on through the clinical trials and the extensive bit. Now, I recognize we're giving up quite a lot of the upside by doing that, but I think we're also managing our risk more effectively by distributing it across nine products, and it, all, it increases the chances of uh, partnerability materially. And what does your cash runway look like? And um, you know, what would you consider in terms of options for further fundraising? Uh, so we have no current plans to fundraise. We sort of uh, established that because there is a view that every time I do one of these presentations, I'm about to launch a fundraise. Uh, we have no current plans to fundraise. Our cash runway takes us uh, into the first quarter of 2023, and we've been very transparent about that. Um, so between now and then, uh, we either need to get one of these licenses off the ground with an upfront and a milestone, which would be my preferred option, or look to do something else you know, sometime towards the back end of uh, 22. But we've got plenty of time between now and then. Well, I wish you every success with that and really some very exciting developments for you, uh, particularly in relation to brain cancer. Thank you so much for talking to us, Stephen. Thank you, Vivian.